hi grade 12s today we are going to do a practical lesson and we are going to be using word processing we are going to look at creating a bookmark now a bookmark is um, almost like a mark a bookmark in a book that you're actually reading physically but instead it's electronic in a word document and it just allows you to move it around in a long document quickly so here's how to create a bookmark first of all you highlight wherever you want your bookmark to be you then are going to click on insert and in the links group we are going to click on bookmark and the first thing you have to do is you have to give your bookmark a name now there's a few things you need to remember when you are giving your bookmark a name grade 12s and that is that you cannot have spaces in between your words so if you are going to give your bookmark um, a name consisting of two words, you cannot have a space between the two words. So I am going to call mine energy saving. And you'll notice that I haven't put a space in between energy saving. Once you've typed in your bookmark, you are going to say add. And then I can go anywhere in my document. And if I want to go back to my bookmark, you can press function key 5 on your keyboard and it brings up the find and replace dialog box and in the go to what pane I'm going to click on bookmark and then on the right hand side it comes up with all the bookmark names that I have you're going to click on the drop down arrow we're going to click on energy saving and we are going to say go to and it takes us straight to the bookmark that we just created so that's very, very simple when it comes to bookmarks. Now, you can also use bookmarks as a cross-reference. Um, so we can click anywhere in your document. And we are going to go to References, Insert, and we're going to go to Cross-reference. And then in the Reference type, it asks you what kind of cross-reference you want. And in this case, it's a bookmark. We want it to insert as a hyperlink. And then for which bookmark, we are going to choose the energy saving bookmark. I'm going to say insert and close. So now if I rest my mouse on um, where I inserted the bookmark and I hold the control key and I click, it's going to take me straight to where the bookmark was created as a cross reference. So that's quite simple um, when it comes to bookmarks. Also, once you've added a bookmark, you might want to delete your bookmark. So again, we are just going to go to bookmark. I'm going to click on the bookmark that I want to delete. And on the right hand side, I'm going to choose delete and close. And you've deleted your bookmark. Right, grade 12. So let's take a look at tracking changes. Now you might want to know what tracking changes are. Tracking changes are insertions in a word document that you can turn on when you are editing a document to share it with somebody else because they can actually see the changes that you make let me show you how you click on review tab and in the tracking group we are going to click on the drop down arrow next to track changes and we are going to activate the track changes now there's a number of options you have with your track changes. So I'm going to click next to show markup. And in the show markup, it'll allow the person who's going to see your document to see the comments, to see the insertions and deletions, any formatting changes you make, um, and all the areas are highlighted. So let me give you an example. I am going to highlight the word initiative and I'm going to delete it. And you'll see that it's put the word in red and it's put a line through it. So the person who's going to read my document knows that I've deleted the word initiative. If I wanted to put a comment in, I'm going to click on new comment and I'm going to say something like use another word for hibernation. Whoever's going to correct my document now will hopefully use another word for hibernate. Um, if I now highlight this line and I make it underlined and I make it bold, on the right hand side you can see that it is formatted to bold and underline. So now once you're done with your document and you've sent it to the person who's going to edit it or make their own changes and the changes are made, 
you make the changes in the following way. In the changes group, I'm going to click on accept. And if I'm happy with all the changes, I'm going to say accept all changes in document. And then you can go to next. And it says you want to continue working in the beginning and I can say yes. And if I don't like the comments, I'm going to right click it and I'm going to say delete. So now if I'm happy with my document, I'm going to go to final show markup. And I'm going to click on that and I'm going to say final show markup. And all the changes have been made. The gray pane has been taken away on the right hand side and your document looks completely normal again. So tracking changes is quite simple to use and you will generally only use tracking changes when you are going to share your document with somebody else. Right, grade 12s, we are moving on to line breaks and widows and orphans. Let's look at line breaks first. Line breaks are forced breaks that you are going to put into your document. You do know by now that when you come to the end of a page in Microsoft Word, it automatically puts in a page break for you. But the page break might be put in in the middle of a paragraph. And if you don't want that, you can go and put your own page break in before words page break. So to do that, you just click with your cursor where you want the page break to occur. In the page layout tab, we are going to go to the page setup group and I'm going to click on the arrow next to breaks. And I am going to choose a page break. And you will see that word has put a page break in for me. Now, it works in a similar way um, when you want to do columns. Say, for instance, you have inserted two columns and um, you want a particular heading to start at the top of the second column. Then all you need to do is go to breaks and you are going to use a column break in that, in that case. So that's basically breaks. But something that I mentioned earlier that we were going to look at is called widows and orphans. Now, you might wonder what is a widow and an orphan. What it does is it is a feature in Word that allows you to keep lines or paragraphs together. And you will find that in paragraph in the home tab. So we're going to click on the arrow for paragraph. And in the line and page breaks, it shows you widow and orphan control, keep with next, keep lines together, or page break before. So if you wanted to keep um, a whole paragraph together, you would highlight the paragraph and you would choose keep lines together. It's as simple as that, grade 12s. So that is basically the section on widows and orphans and line breaks. In the next section, we are going to look at revising electronic forms, and then we are going to import that electronic form data into a spreadsheet. Okay, grade 12s, we're going to take a look at revising electronic forms. So remember, when you do an electronic form, the first thing you need to do is make sure that you have the developer tab available. If you don't have the developer tab available, this is how you get it. You are going to click on File. You are going to go to Options. And then you are going to click on Customize Ribbon. And on the right-hand side, under Customize Ribbon, you are going to look until you find Developer. You're going to tick the developer box and you're going to say OK. And then your developer tab will appear on your ribbon. Now grade 12s, in the developer tab, you have to go to your controls group. Okay? And in your controls group, you have a little toolbox over here. You're going to click on the drop down arrow. And when you are using forms, we are only going to deal with the top half of the toolbox and that is the legacy forms. In the legacy forms, we are going to work with text fields. We are also going to work with check boxes and drop down fields. So I've created a form very quickly for you, but um, I'll show you how I created it. So if we want to insert a text field next to name, Remember, it's the Developer tab, the Controls group. I'm going to click on the arrow next to the Tools, and I'm going to go to my Text Form field. And it puts a little gray bar in, and that is your field. 
Now you can actually go and format that field. So I'm going to right click on the field and I'm going to go to properties. And in the text form field dialog box, you have an option of changing the data type of your text. So we can make it number, date, calculation or regular text. You can choose how long or how short you want your text to be. We can make our name 30. And then you have an option of, of how you want to format your text, whether you want it to be typed in uppercase, lowercase, first capital, or title case. So just to show you, I'm going to click on uppercase and I'm going to say OK. So now how did we insert a checkbox? Let me show you how we inserted a checkbox. You click where you want your checkbox to be inserted. I'm going back to the legacy tools and I'm going to click on the checkbox form field. Now you can also format your text box. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to go to properties. Now the way to format it is that you can change the size and then you can also decide whether you want it checked or not checked. So just as an example, I'm going to click on checked and say OK. So now every time someone fills in this form, you'll see that this text box will be checked. So now the next thing we're going to look at is a drop down form field. And what that does is it gives the person who's filling in your form a choice or a list to choose from. So I'm going back to my legacy tools. I'm going to click on my drop down list. I've got to go back to properties if I want to add anything. And then where it says drop down item is where you, where you are going to type in the things that the user is going to choose from. So I'm going to say red, then you click on add, blue, green, yellow, and once we've um, locked the form, you'll be able to make a choice. So now, as your form stands, grades 12, you cannot fill in your form. In order to fill in your form, you have to lock the form. So to do that, you need to go to Review. And then in the Protect group, you are going to click on Restrict Editing. And in the Editing Restrictions, we are only going to choose for filling in forms. And then you are going to say, Yes, Start Enforcing Protection. It's going to ask you for a password, but please don't type in a password in case you forget it. So I'm going to leave my password blank and I'm going to say OK. So now I can go ahead and I can fill in my form. And you just use your tab key to go from one to the next. And you'll see our drop down list gives me an arrow and it gives me an option to choose whatever color I like. OK, grade 12. We've done our forms. We are now going to use the data in the form and we are going to import it to an Excel spreadsheet. But before you do that, there's a few steps you have to take note of. I have opened a form that has been completed. So now you have to prepare your form to be exported or imported into Excel. And we do this by doing the following. You're going to click on File and we are going to go to Options. And in Options, we are going to click on Advanced. Then you're going to scroll down in your Advanced dialog box until you find the Saving option. And underneath Save, it says Preserve Fidelity when sharing this document. And you are going to click the checkbox that says Save Form Data as a Delimited Text File. So what a delimited text file is, grade 12, it is a file where the information is separated either by a comma or a tab. So once you've done that, you are going to say OK. And then we are going to save this. So we're going to go to File, Save As. Can you see immediately it's going to save the form as a text form? So I'm happy to call it Form and I'm going to say Save. It's going to show me what it looks like. Can you see the data is separated by commas? I'm going to say OK. And then I'm going to close my form. And then you can see the text form over here. I'm going to open my Excel spreadsheet where I want the form imported to. 
Right, once you've opened your Excel and you're ready to import your data, you're going to click on data. We are going to go to get external data and we know that it's coming from text, so you're going to click on from text. Then you have to go and find wherever your data was saved. You're going to click on the form and you're going to say import. And it's going to tell you that choose the file type that best describes your data. And in this case, it's delimited because they are separated with commas. You're going to say next. And you're going to say next. And then finish. And it asks you where do you want to put it. And you're going to say OK. And it's inserted your information into your spreadsheet. So grade 12s not only do you have the option of inserting your data into a spreadsheet, but it works exactly the same way um, when you insert it into a Word document. Right, grade 12s, let's look at a mail merge. What is a mail merge? A mail merge is bringing together um, a list of addresses or other sort of data together with a Word document where you can send it out in bulk. For instance, I could send out one letter to a hundred people telling them about a new product if I was a company. So now a mail merge consists of two sources. The first source is your main document and your main document is either letters or labels or envelopes or an email and then your second source is the data source and that is something like a contact list. So where do we find mail merge? Mail merge is in the mailings tab and the mailing ribbon. And then there are basically only five mail merge commands. So five steps that you've got to follow to do a mail merge. The first is starting your mail merge. So you're going to decide what sort of um, main document you're going to have. The second one is where you select your recipients, um, whether it be a contact list, etc. The third one is where you are going to insert your fields. So what are you going to use in your main document, like names, surnames, addresses. Then you're going to look at what your letter will look like. And then you are going to finish the merge. So it's quite simple. Now, there are various data sources that you can use. You can use a database. You can use a spreadsheet. You can use a word table. You can use a text file or you can use an Outlook contact list. There's just something that you've got to remember if you want to use a spreadsheet and a Word table grade 12s is that if you are using your spreadsheet, the very first row has to contain the data for your fields. And the same works for your Word table and it's got to be the first thing in your Word document. So let's go and put this into practice. Okay, I have a letter that I'm going to use to merge with a um, database contact list. So I am going to go and I'm going to start my mail merge. So I'm going to click on mailings. I'm going to go to start mail merge and we want to have letters. Okay, the next thing is we are going to select our recipients. And in this case, it is an existing list. So now you've got to go and find where your existing list is. So where you've saved your database, or where you've saved your Excel. So once you've found it, you're going to say open. And now we are ready to move on to our third step, which is inserting our merge fields. So I'm going to click on the drop down arrow next to merge field and I'm going to choose initial. I'm going to put a space in and I'm going to choose surname. Then I'm going to even put in the flat number. And um, that's all I'm going to do for this exercise. So I've put in the fields that I want. And you will notice, grades 12, that your fields are inserted in triangular brackets. So now that I've put my fields in, remember the next step is to preview the results. So I'm going to click on preview results. So this is what the letters will look like that's going to go out to all the tenants going to go to H Smith and H Smith is in flat number one. So if you are happy with that, we are going to do the fifth step and we are going to finish our merge. 
So you're going to click on the arrow next to finish merge and you're going to choose edit individual documents. We want it to merge with all the records and I'm going to say OK. You can see that um, our database has got 11 records on in it because it's, we've got one of 11 pages. And if I scroll down, you can see everybody has got the initials, their surname and their flat number in. So it makes your work a lot quicker and a lot more efficient by doing the mail merge. And grade 12s, you can even save your main document as it is. But there's just one thing I want to remind you of, is that when you are doing your mail merge, you have to, have to, have to finish it, edit your individual documents, and say, OK. If you don't do that, when an examiner opens your mail merge, they are only going to get this page. So they will only see page one of one and not the 11 records that you were actually going to merge your database with. So it's just something to keep in mind if you get a mail merge question in your exam paper. Okay, we are going to look at the section on publishing a document. Um, grade 12s, there are various ways of publishing a document and it actually means publishing an electronic document in different formats. So you can send a document as an email, attachment, etc. Now, before you can publish a document or save and sa you have to save your document. Okay, um, and using the save and send option allows you to send your document to a central location. So your document can be shared with other people. Um, and whoever you've shared it with can make changes at the same time to the same document. Um, so you can see that all the changes are being made together. The next option we have grade 12s in saving and sharing is saving it to the web. So what happens when you save a document to the web is that it is stored on a web server and the word processing web application can be used to open the document in your web browser. Then we can save to SharePoint and what SharePoint is, is they are libraries that are, are locations on special types of internet sites. Okay, so if you save in a SharePoint, you can store and control how your files are created, and you can view them, and you can track and manage them. At the same time, other people have access to the files, so they can also read and edit them, and changes can be made to the same copy of the document, which is quite useful when it comes to a number of people working on the same document. And then we've got publish as a blog post. I'm not going to go through this because we actually published a blog post in a previous lesson. So it was actually quite simple and straightforward. And then we have different file types. Now we've learned of file types before grade 12s. You have read only. So a read only file or a readable file cannot be edited. It can only be read. Whereas an editable file can be changed by somebody else. So if you want to publish your document as a readable file and not editable, you save it as a PDF or XPS um, or in HTML format. And if you want your document to be read and edited, you can save it in basically any text editing program. So now this is how you change the file types. To change the file types, you're going to click on Change File Type. And then in the right-hand pane, it's going to tell you what options you have to change the file type to. So you have an open document text. You can save it as a template. You can save it as plain text, etc. So that's pretty easy. So once you've made your choice, you just need to click on Save As, and then it'll give you an option to click on OK. Now, the fixed file formats, remember I said before, if you don't want your file to be edited and only read, then you have to save it as a PDF or an XPS. And then you are going to click on Create PDF or XPS document when you save it. Um, and then you also have an option, if you want to save it to the web, to minimize the size of your file. And you're going to use this especially if you are going to print it online. And then once you've decided on your fixed file format, you don't have to publish your whole document. You can actually choose whether you want to do the whole one 
a current page, if you've highlighted a certain section in your document, or say for instance you want to um, only publish page two to four. So it gives you that choice. And once you've made your selection, you are going to click on OK, and then finally you're going to click on Publish. So let's quickly go and look at that in practice, grade 12. So I'm going to go to File, and I'm going to, you can see immediately it stops, it defaults on Info. And um, I'm going to click on Save and Send. And here's all the options that I spoke about earlier. You've got Send using an email, Save to Web, Save to SharePoint, Publish as a Blog, Change the File Type, and here is how to create a PDF or XPS document. So that's basically how you prepare a document to send. But now, before we can send our documents, you may not want all your personal information or any personal information to go along with your document. What happens when you create a Word document is in the background, Word creates or collects something called metadata. And what metadata is, is it is personal info like the name of the author, the date the document was published, etc. Now, if you don't want anybody to see that, you can take all of that away. And you do that by going to File and clicking on Info. Then you click on Check for Issues, and you choose Inspect Document. And you can see it says, Check the document for hidden properties or personal information. So we're going to click on that, and it comes up with a list of all the metadata. So, for instance, if you don't want anybody to see comments, revisions, etc., you are going to take it off. If you don't want people to see the personal information, you are going to take that off. And once you are done, you can inspect your document, and it will come up with the inspection results. And if you are happy, you can say close, and then you can send your document. Okay, grade 12, in this section, we are going to focus on aspects um, in the page layout tab. So what happens in page layout is it allows our document to be created in a more professional way. So I'm just quickly going to look at the ribbons and the groups available in page layout. So in page layout, you have an option of themes. Okay, so you can change the theme of your document to make it more interesting. Okay. You can change the colors, and it'll change the color of your headings, etc. You have the option of changing margins. You can change your page layout from portrait to landscape. You can change the size of your paper. You can put certain information into columns, if that's what you wanted. Okay. You can do breaks and line breaks. So that's basically page setup. The next thing in page layout is page background, and this allows you to put in a watermark if you wanted to. You can change the color of your page if you need it to. You can add page borders if you want to. And then the last thing we're going to look at is the paragraph group. And in the paragraph group, you have the option of whether you want to indent a paragraph if you want to only indent the first line by a certain amount of percentages, you can change your line spacing and your paragraph spacing. And then lastly, in paragraph, you can go and set tabs. Now, grades 12, these are all ways you can make your document look more professional. And it's a good idea to keep up to date and to practice them, especially if you want your word reports for your patch to look professional. And that is the end of our lesson on... Microsoft Word for today.